Hi, it's Dwyer, RichardDwyer.com. I'm an attorney in Northern California. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, we're going to speculate here in this video. I'm not making statements of fact. What I'm going to do is just refer to the evidence and let you decide whether or not the evidence points toward any particular individual. Right? I have my own thoughts. It might come through in this video, but I'm certainly not making factual assertions. Twenty years ago, on Christmas night in 1996, at 755 15th Street in Boulder, Colorado, a six-year-old girl was vaginally assaulted, suffered a fractured skull. She was strangled using a cord tightened by a broken stick. She was murdered. Her name was John Benet Ramsey. Now, 20 years later, I'm releasing this on Christmas Day, 2016. I believe, as in most cases that we discuss here on this YouTube channel, you can find some of the videos at DwyerCrime.blog. I believe that the killers made some mistakes. Killer or killers, right? The death may have been intentional, it may have been accidental. I believe that the people responsible for John Benet's death made some mistakes. That we can actually look at the facts of the case and point them out. Now, the first mistake, and I believe this is foundational, right? The family lives in a mansion. The first mistake is that the ransom note that contains a 10 a.m. deadline in it is found on a hard-to-find, underused back staircase. Right? Now, let's invent. We're just speculating here. Right? I'm a civil attorney. I'm not a criminal attorney. We're just speculating here. Let's invent a reasonable kidnapper standard, right? If there's a kidnapper involved here or a wannabe kidnapper, <clears throat> do you believe that they would leave the ransom note, not in the kitchen, not on the front staircase, but on a back staircase? hoping that the note is found so that the family would be able to respond to a relatively short deadline, right? I'm guessing many of you on Christmas Day are going to wake up and start your day after 10 a.m. If a kidnapper took your daughter, wouldn't the kidnapper want you to find the note as quickly as possible? They wouldn't leave it in some little used corner of your house, right? Hell, how would they know the parts of your house that you use? So I'm guessing the reasonable kidnapper, if there's such a thing, would leave the note probably on your kitchen table, maybe in a bathroom by the sink, and it would have to be a bathroom close to a bedroom so they know you're going to see the note in time to get their ransom call at 10 a.m., right, in time to pay the ransom. Here the note is actually left someplace that's not well-traveled. Now understand, at 5.52 a.m. that morning, 5.52 a.m. Patsy Ramsey has already found the note and calls the police to say that she's found a ransom note 
and that her daughter was missing. Right? This note somehow is found on a back staircase before 6 a.m. in the morning. Let's go one step further. I believe another mistake is the amount of ransom requested. Now again, let's use a standard we've invented here. The reasonable kidnapper standard. You've broken into a millionaire's house. You're kidnapping the daughter. There's a bunch of risk involved, right? Maybe someone catches you in the act. How do you explain being in somebody else's house with their six-year-old daughter on your way out the door, right? How do you, how do you explain this crime away if you're caught. Also, let's face it too, if you're busted during a kidnapping, you're going to end up in prison for several years. Isn't kidnapping also a federal offense? Right? You're not just worried about the local cops, you're worried about the federal cops. Incredibly, this note only asked for a hundred and eighteen thousand dollars a hundred and eighteen thousand dollars how many kidnappers are gonna ask for such a small amount for such a large crime isn't this amount listed in the note too small for the risk involved in kidnapping a young toddler from a wealthy family more importantly, the amount is almost identical to the amount of John Ramsey's bonus for 1996. How would the kidnapper know the amount of money John Ramsey was getting in bonus that year? Well, I believe there's some other mistakes, right? The police, in searching through the house, actually found the pad on which the ransom note was written. What kidnapper enters a house to kidnap a child without bringing the note with them? Right? If you're a kidnapper, aren't you trying to get in and out as quickly as possible? You're not going to enter the house and then start writing a note in the house. Doesn't that increase your risk exponentially? First of all, how do you know if you're in somebody else's house that you're going to find a pen and paper to write a note. There's a troubling fact here that's been overlooked by much of the media. The pad on which the note was written shows signs of an effort to cover up that it was the pad used. Right? The pages used for the ransom note aren't pulled off the top of the pad. It's not the first few pages. No, they're actually from the middle of the pad. I believe an outsider who has entered your home and is using your pad to write a ransom note as they're kidnapping your child wouldn't care which pages of the pad were used. They would use the top pages. They would just start writing, wouldn't they? The author of this note decided to use the middle pages. Why did the author find it necessary to try to hide the identity of the pad that was used to write the ransom note? Let's dig a little deeper because the note is one of the Rosetta Stones of this case. Isn't the note too long? Right? Doesn't the note say too much? Most ransom notes, it's my understanding, and 
correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section to this video. Most ransom notes would be brief, right? We got your daughter. We want $3 million. We'll call at 10 a.m., right? This note, it's a three-pager. Three pages. The kidnapper not only doesn't bring the note with them to the crime scene, but once at the crime scene, the kidnapper, according to some reports, would have taken 21 minutes to write this three-page note. 21 minutes. Let me add, too, that the note is too articulate. It conveys a level of education that's too revealing for a kidnapper who would be trying to hide their identity. Right? Let me just read a couple of lines from this note. Here's one. And ask yourself if your picture of the reasonable kidnapper would have that person writing these sentences. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. Right? Words like deviation. Here's another sentence. This one's even more curious. You can try to deceive us, but be warned we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures. How many kidnappers are busting out words like countermeasures? As you're watching crime shows on ID Network and other channels, how many times do you see the criminally accused using words like countermeasures? If you're in a time-sensitive situation, let's say you happen to be in a millionaire's home, right, in an attempt to kidnap their six-year-old daughter, are you writing three-page notes with the presence of mind to use sentences like countermeasures, right, words like countermeasures? Well, Let's talk about other mistakes. The note is signed SBTC. Right again, SBTC. Now I want you to think about your own life. How many of you have been involved in groups, schools, places with these initials? Is there a way you could weave SBTC into your experience? For many of you, the answer is going to be no, right? SBTC, it's hard to put those letters together for any part of your background. But it just so happens that John Ramsey, while in the Navy, was stationed at a training center called Subic Bay Training Center. Right, a training center with those initials, S, B, T, C. Let me say this too. Let's say you're the reasonable kidnapper. Let's say you're an articulate kidnapper who uses words like countermeasures in your vocabulary, right? And let's say you're about to break into some millionaire's mansion on Christmas. Would it cross your mind that that mansion might actually have a house alarm on it? Right? Wouldn't you stop for a moment and say, gee, you know, is it possible that if I break in, an alarm's going to go off? 
I might get caught. Right? Who knows? Maybe they're cameras. Maybe you're there breaking in and a camera is recording your height, your weight, your clothes, etc. Now, would it surprise you to know that the house actually had an alarm system on it? Right? Keep in mind there are two young kids in the house, John Bonet and her older brother. Right? Two young kids. They have an alarm system on the house. Somehow that night the alarm system was not on. Right? Does that disturb you at all? In looking at the facts of this case. Now there's a detective. Linda Arndt. Right? A-R-N-D-T. She was there that morning, right, at 10 a.m., when the call was supposed to come from the kidnappers according to the kidnapping note, right? According to this detective, a member of law enforcement, that 10 a.m. deadline comes and goes without either Ramsey commenting on the fact that the kidnapper had not called. Now, if it's your child and you receive a note that says, we'll call at 10 o'clock, would you be concerned that no call was received at 10 o'clock? Would you be by a phone ready for a call at 10 o'clock? Right? Just ask yourself the reaction here. Was it the reaction you would expect? Now let's talk about John Bonet's body when it's found. John Bonet weighs approximately 45 pounds. The body is found downstairs in the basement in a back room. There are signs of vaginal trauma, right? It's a terrible crime, folks. Now, would an intruder molest the child in the home? Is that believable to you? The intruder enters the home. People are asleep. The intruder gets the six-year-old and rather than leave with the six-year-old the intruder decides to molest the child in the home do you believe that would happen let me point out too that there's evidence that the body was actually wiped an attempt was made to clean the body right not a lot of blood is found except for some blood on John Bonet's thigh. Right? Someone cleaned up some of the blood. If you're the kidnapper and you've killed a child after molesting them, would you be concerned with cleaning up the body? Also, this basement. Right? You're in a mansion. It's dark. How competent would, let's say, the reasonable kidnapper be in finding a back room in the basement of a mansion while carrying a 45-pound child? I'm telling you many people I know couldn't carry a 45 pound weight right downstairs through hallways etc right here we're to believe that that's what happened either that or the child is alive and somehow subdued walking with the perpetrator or perpetrators
I believe more mistakes are made and I want you to Google this because some of these facts are online. This next one to me is a whopper. The panties John Bonet is found in aren't her size. They're too big for her. Now according to some reports here online, Patsy Ramsey at first denies that the underwear John Bonet is found in was John Bonet's. Patsy then corrects herself and tells police that the underwear was John Bonet's but wasn't bought for John Bonet. It was actually bought for another girl, a girl named Jenny, who may have been a niece. Right? Now you need to Google this point. Because understand, there's DNA from an unknown man on John Bonet's panties. Now can we trust this DNA evidence if the panties were not John Bonet's size and might not have been John Bonet's? Right? It's a very important question. Very important question. Right? Why are John Bonet's panties the wrong size? Right? Patsy Ramsey told authorities that John Bonet loved the panties. So Patsy decided not to give them to the person who she bought the panties for. Right? Are the panties a sign of a cover-up? Let's get to perhaps the most damning piece of evidence. The pineapple in John Bonet's stomach when she's found. Understand the parents claim that John Bonet did not eat pineapple the night she's murdered. But yet pineapple is found in her stomach. And there is a bowl of pineapple on the Ramsey's dining room table. The question is, who served John Bonet the pineapple after her parents went to bed? Is it reasonable to assume that an intruder somehow gets John Bonet out of her bedroom and then decides to take her to the family dining room where the intruder, while the family's in the house, feeds John Bonet pineapple. Let's talk too about the strangulation stick that's intertwined in the rope that was used to strangle John Bonet. Did you know that that stick came from one of Patsy Ramsey's paint brushes? Right, think about it. According to reports here online, right, came from one of Patsy Ramsey's paint brushes. Now how unprepared could this killer have been? or killers. They show up at the house without a ransom note. They then write the ransom note at the house. Somewhere along the line they decide to kill John Bonet and they have to use items at the house to do so. At least the paintbrush item. Right? Is that believable? Let's talk about the duct tape. Now this is really fascinating to me. Did you know that the duct tape looks like it was already used for something else? Right? This duct tape doesn't look like it was freshly cut. It looks like someone took duct tape from someplace else and used it to cover John Bonet's mouth. This is used duct tape. 
Now, when you put duct tape over a person's mouth, if they're fighting you, if there's resistance, it's going to show on the duct tape, right? If I'm moving my lips, you're trying to subdue me and I'm moving my lips and I'm saying, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to box you or wrestle with you or resist you, the duct tape's going to show some trauma. Here, the duct tape shows a perfect set of John Bonet's lips. Right? The duct tape is consistent with an argument that it was placed on John Bonet's mouth after she was unconscious. Why would a perpetrator? want to stage a crime scene, right? If, if the perp is there and John Bonet has a fractured skull and John Bonet is unconscious and stuff like that, why would the perp then put used duct tape, used duct tape over the victim's mouth? Right? I think it's a pretty big question here. Right? Is it possible? We're just speculating here. Is it possible that an effort was made to contaminate the crime scene? To take bits and pieces from elsewhere? Right? Use duct tape that would have other things on the duct tape. Apparently animal hairs are on the duct tape that can't be traced to the house. Right? Is it possible that someone took duct tape that was used and then included it in this crime scene so that the cops got errant clues about what happened? Right? Let me say this also. I know Detective Lou Smith believes that an intruder came through a broken window that was by the basement. Right? Wow. How is that possible when the window grate had a spider web on it that was undisturbed? Is your typical kidnapper, right, one who apparently is only seeking $118,000 for high-risk jobs like this, right, um, apparently seeking it in a way where they don't even follow up with the 10 a.m. phone call, is your typical kidnapper able to get through a window without disturbing a spider web on the window grate? Right, so, in my opinion, the official story of this crime doesn't make sense. Right, I, I look at this evidence, in particular the ransom note, the multi-pager, right, written on a pad from inside the house. I look at that ransom note. And I look at the pineapple in the victim's stomach. And I look at the incongruity with the stories I'm hearing from the people who have been accused. And I just wonder what's going on. Right? It's possible this crime scene was contaminated in such a way where it would be impossible to convict someone with proof beyond a reasonable doubt at the end of a criminal trial. But that doesn't mean that the person or people didn't commit the crime. Right? Let's just use common sense here. Right? I encourage you to explain this evidence 
right? Even if you're on the other side of it, where you believe in, you know, uh, the idea that there's an intruder or any scenario that you believe is cut and dry, right? I hope you leave that information here in the comment section to this video, right? I just have a hard time believing that your typical kidnapper is going to pick hard to find places in the house like back stairways to leave ransom notes. I have a hard time believing that a kidnapper is going to do a kidnapping where they don't even bring the ransom note with them and they just assume they're going to find a pad and a pen at the kidnapper's residence, excuse me, the victim's residence without awaking anyone, right? I just have a hard time believing that someone would look at a mansion and just know that the alarm is going to be off. Also, some of the evidence here, I just don't believe that if the kidnappers brought duct tape with them, that the duct tape would have animal hairs on it and would already be torn. It seems to me that some of the evidence here really uh, has been tampered with, if not staged. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Right? I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Right? Finally, let me close too by saying SBTC. Right? How many kidnappers are going to come up with that set of initials and have it just happen to correspond with the same initials used by a training center that one of the parents was involved with? Right? Startling stuff. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks for stopping by.